Give me, O oh Lord, a united heart that I might serve you and love you with everything that I am. Because the pure in heart will see God and we will be with him for all of eternity. Well, good morning. It's good to see you here this morning. And as I look around, it's encouraging to see a few more pews with people in them every single Sunday. And so uh, if, you are, if you are still at home, we are glad to have you watching. But we would even be more glad if you could come and be with us. One of the things you need to be doing here is in is welcoming new people. Uh, you may be surprised, but we've had a number of new people here who had never attended before in the last few weeks. And uh, we need our folks to help them to feel welcome and know that we are glad to have them with us. It has been encouraging to me this morning that I have discovered that people actually listen to some of the things I say. Some people ask me if I remembered my coffee this morning. Several pointed out to me, having heard about my interest in trains, this engine behind me this morning, and, and uh, another few asked me if I'd had some good cake lately. And so, you, you know, it's, it's a blessing that people listen and remember some of the things I say. Now, if somebody could just remember something I preached about, <laughs> I'd be even more encouraged. Sometimes we as Christians are criticized for speaking Christianese. That is to say, sometimes we use language that would be familiar to us if we've been in church all of our lives, but would not be readily understood by people that we are trying to communicate the gospel to. And I ran across one criticism some time ago now, that uh, we shouldn't be telling people, especially children, uh, trust Jesus and he will come and live in your heart. What does that mean, they said. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Now some of the criticisms that we are uh, given are valid. Some maybe not so much. So let's do a little secular test this morning. And I'm going to start a sentence. And I need you to finish it. And feel welcome to finish it right out loud if you like. So we're not talking church. We're talking out in everyday life. And here are some things. You've all heard these sentences. Uh, a, a person speaking to his or her spouse. I love you with all of my... Thank you very much. Um, talking about your kids or the Blue Jays. They lost the game, but they played with a lot of heart. Most of the great issues of life are issues of the... Wow. Everybody's filling these in with the same word. Now we are getting to the blank of the matter. The heart of the matter. All right. So, maybe... When people are talking every day, not talking about church things or religious things, and they speak this language, they are speaking maybe the same language that you and I speak in this particular instance. And Jesus talks about the heart as well. We have been going through in the last number of weeks the Beatitudes 
And we, we have been reading this passage. Jesus is with his disciples and, and seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those, the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will find mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. All of these are promises that Jesus has made. These are statements of absolute fact. He says, he doesn't say will, which would speak of the future simply, but he says shall, which speaks of a definite future. They shall experience these things. And this is Jesus' promise that the pure in heart shall see God. You know, a lot of times we are criticized for our confidence in our salvation. And if somebody says, well, do you think you'll go to heaven when you die? And, and you should say to them, well, <laughs> actually, I'm certain of it. And they'll look at you and say, oh, so you really think you're pretty good, don't you? And we would respond, no. I don't think I'm good at all. I have experienced poverty of spirit. I have mourned for my sins. I have humbled myself before God. I have hungered and thirsted after righteousness. And I have then reflected the mercy of God in my life. And God has begun to work in me purity of heart. Not mine, but his. It's a remarkable statement. It's an amazing utterance. And that sequence of thought in the Beatitudes has brought us to here. We've, we've talked about our relationship with God, our mourning for sin and that sort of thing. We've talked about our relationship with other people. But our relationships are actually a triangle. We're related to other people. We're related to God. And and there's a three-way thing, us and others and God, going on. When Jesus talks about our heart here, what do you suppose he means? And as I ask myself that question, I, I found a number of scriptures that speak to that. Uh, uh, scriptures that use this word in, in context. And so if I went over to Romans chapter 1 and verse 21, Paul is talking to us about people in history, the history of the world, and how people who knew God then left God, and the world has become worse and worse, and people have left the righteousness that God originally created us to be. And he says in verse 21, For although they knew God... They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Their thinking was wrong. That's what Paul tells us. And, and then he says their foolish hearts. And so he identifies our heart with our mind our thinking. Our heart is influenced by our thinking and is a part of our thinking. And if I were to go over to the next page in Scripture, and that's always a hard thing to do because the pages are hard to separate, and, and uh, go to chapter 2 and verse 5, I would read this. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment 
will be revealed. Our hard and impenitent hearts, he talks about. And, and that speaks to my will. I, I am unwilling to let God have his way in my life. I am unwilling to do the things that God wants for me. I am unwilling. And so I have my mind and my will. And if I turned over the page one more time, I would find in chapter 5 and verse 5, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so that speaks to our emotions. So we have now, the heart involves our intellect, our will, and our emotions. Do you know what the definition of a human being is? Someone who has intellect, will, and emotions. He is speaking of the entirety of my being. Everything that I am is involved when the Bible speaks of my heart. It's talking about my personality. It's talking about the real me and the real you. And the problem is, the real me isn't perfect. In fact, in the Old Testament, Je uh, Jeremiah says to us in chapter 17 and verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. My heart is desperately sick. I don't really like that too much. Out of the heart proceed thoughts, evil thoughts, Jesus says. Murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. Everything that's wrong in the world, everything that's wrong in the world, proceeds from the heart of mankind. From the heart of men and women. Everything. And so our hearts need to be changed. And when we talk about changing our hearts, we're talking about changing everything that we are, everything that we experience. The problem is not our environment. The problem is our nature. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. In sin did my mother conceive me. Now, let's be very clear. David was not saying that the act of conception, the act that led to conception was sinful. No, that's not what David was saying at all. Because God says that uh, that was his gift to a man and his wife. What was, what was sinful? The creation that began in my mother's womb at the moment of con conception, that new being which was a living human being from the very moment of conception was sinful. Before I ever got here, I was sinful. You see, our sinful nature has been passed down from our forebears. We, since Adam, Jesus said, all the human race has come from Adam and Eve and through Adam, our sinful nature has come to us. Well, that's bad news, but we're not done yet, so don't leave. It, you'll hear people say, well, when we, when we talk about some sinful things that, the, the, that we deal with in life and that people are involved with sinful behaviors, sinful lifestyles. And, and people say to you, well, well it, you know, he can't help it. He was born that way. This is the way she was from birth. And that's true. The problem is, we are all from birth born with a sinful nature. A nature that needs to be changed. And the great, glorious, exciting good news of the gospel is that Jesus wants to change our nature through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That's the promise. You see, 
although the news to start with is bad and the news in these uh, Beatitudes to begin with is bad, the promise is there's an opportunity to change all of that and to become different than we were before and for God to work in our lives and make us who he wants to be. And so the, the pure in heart, that's the opposite to a man's natural heart. That's the opposite to the way a woman was born. We're, we're told we should have a, a single eye and we need a single heart. In, in Mark chapter 7 and verse 21, Jesus is speaking again. And he says, For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. My problem is not out here. My problem is not over there. My problem is in here. In here. In myself. The psalmist cried out to God an interesting prayer in Psalm 86 and verse 11. He says, Unite my heart to fear your name. Unite my heart. You know, I think almost all of us have, have some desire to be better. We have some desire to be good, to be godly, to be righteous. There's, there's some desire in there for that. But there's a lot of other desires in there too, isn't there? Aren't there? We have, we have evil desires. We have desires that are bad for us. We have desires that lead us away from God. And the psalmist is crying out to God and the same is in the New Testament. Unite my heart to fear you, to praise you, to serve you, to honor you. Bring my heart to that place where it all wants really and totally to serve you. In Psalm 24, the psalmist says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? That's, that's a pretty good question, isn't it? That's a very important question. Who will stand in the Lord's presence? And the, his answer is, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Or again in Psalm 51, David is crying out to God after he had committed the great sin of adultery with Bathsheba and left her husband to die. And David comes to God and he says, Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. You and I can come and ask God to wash us, and he will make us whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. You know where there's a, there's a temptation for you and me to, to look at ungodly people. People who have no time for God at all. And to, to envy them. They seem to be doing so well. They seem to be having happy lives. Everything seems to be going well for them. And you wouldn't be the first person to ever struggle with that. Another psalmist said... Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps 
had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Imagine that. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Now, <laughs> is that true? It's not true. But it looks to be true to us many times. Sometimes we look around and, and people have said to me, Pastor, why is this happening to me? I'm a good person. And other people who are obviously not good persons are doing just fine. Well, the psalmist came to the conclusion that he was mistaken and that God was good to him. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God and then I discerned their end. You see, the end is not yet. The end is sometime in the future. And those who are pure in heart, their end will be to experience God forever and ever. To have a glorious and exciting relationship with Him which shall last for all of eternity in a place where there needs to be no sun and no moon because God will be with them and there will be no night there. That's the promise that we have. I have a divided heart, but I need a united heart. A cleansed heart. In Revelation chapter 21, he says, They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Those who are written in, in that book. A book that God is writing. And it's not a book that is a book of all the good things I've done and all the bad things I've done. And then we weigh and see which one is heavier. And if it goes this way, I'm in good shape and if it goes this way I'm in trouble no th this is a book that is called the Lamb's Book of Life the Bible presents Jesus as the Lamb of God in the picture of the Old Testament sacrifices the one who was sacrificed for the sin of the world every person in the world and anyone who comes to that Lamb and who trusts him as Lord and Savior is written down in the Lamb's book of life and everything is different from then on. You see, Jesus gave us a command. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus answered. He had been asked a question. What is the, what's the most important uh, of the commandments, Lord? What you, you know, if I want to start somewhere, where do I start? And Jesus answered him. The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. This is the command that Jesus has given. This is the order of importance that Jesus has given. Love the Lord your God. Give me, O Lord, a united heart that I might serve you and love you with everything that I am because the pure in heart will see God and we will be with him for all of eternity. You see, there's a variety of ways of seeing God. When my whole being desires him. We can see God in nature. 
Did you know that? The Bible says that people are without excuse because you can see God in nature. You don't even need the Bible. You don't need anything to know that there is a God and to know some things about God. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs his course with joy. The, the psalmist says you can know there's a God just by looking up into the sky. You can know there's a God by looking out into creation and seeing the design that is there in all of creation. You can, you can know there is a God, but you can't know God that way. You, you can't look out into nature and say, oh, I, I'm going to worship the God of nature because you don't know what he's like. You can only know God if he has revealed himself to us. You can only know someone else as they will reveal themselves to you. I can hide who I am behind a shadow and, and, and make sure you don't know the real me. I can do that. And God can do that too. But God has not done that. If I were to go on and continue reading in that chapter, I, I would read this. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than, also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. God has revealed himself to us. We can know what God is like. We can know not only that there is a creator out there, but we can know a God who loves us and cares for us and has poured out into our hearts his love if we will come to him come to him in meekness come to him in mourning for our sin come to him in trust asking him to change us and to make us his children and we can be absolutely certain that we are children of God not because of anything that we have done not because of anything that I have done but because of what he has done on the cross. Or I could go to Hebrews chapter 11 and find God in history. In verse 27, it says, By faith, we're speaking of... Uh, <clears throat> Moses... By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He, he endured the danger because he saw someone who is invisible. You see, God had revealed himself. He, and because God had revealed himself, Moses could see that which was not visible. His, it wasn't with his eyes in his head that he saw but the eyes of his heart saw and understood God because God had revealed himself to him and then we can see God also in our own lives God's promises all things work together for good to them who love God to them who are called according to his purpose that doesn't mean everything that comes into your life is good <laughs> you know that far from it Lots of bad things come into our lives. But even the bad things, he's telling us, can work together for good, ultimately. 
And the Bible says this, God is a debtor to no man. There is no suffering that you can have for God. There is no suffering in your life that God might allow that you will ultimately say, God owes me. Because God will make it all up and more in our lives. And then we can know him in glory. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, we are God's children now. Did you get that? We are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that, that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we'll see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They will know God for all of eternity. And that's the promise that is held before us. That's the motivation that God offers to you and to me to seek a pure heart. The motivation that forever and ever we will be with Jesus. The motivation that we might originally come to God. I was <clears throat> invited to a friend's wedding. His, uh, it was his second marriage. His first wife had gone to be with the Lord. And uh, some years later, he, he married again. And he had two pastors performing the ceremony. I guess he wanted to get it right. And uh, uh, he had told them, now share the gospel in the wedding. A very valid thing, I would think. And so, one of the pastors got up and told us all to turn to Jesus and, and come to him and get saved. And, and he spent about 20 minutes telling us that. And not one time in his 20-minute message did he mention, why in the world would I want to come to know Jesus? Did you stop thinking about, why would I want to come? Why would I want to come to him? He gave me no motivation whatsoever. So folks, <laughs> let me not be guilty of that sin. Let me tell you that in coming to Jesus and trusting him as your own personal savior, you will be led to that place of purity of heart and you will know God and experience heaven and eternity with him and with all of his in righteousness where there is no more sin, where there is no more sorrow, where there are no more tears and where God is with us and will be with us forever and ever. There is a motivation why you should come to Jesus. There is a motivation why you and I should seek purity of heart in our daily lives and the motivation is Jesus and our relationship with him both now and for all of eternity. Our Father, give us a united heart. Father, may we seek purity in our daily lives. Father, Give us that sense of purpose and knowledge of a relationship with Jesus that changes who we are and changes our eternal destiny. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with us as we close this morning. Thank you.
purify my heart let me be as gold pure gold refiner's fire my heart's one desire is to be Thank you for joining our broadcast today of Hope of Glory, presented by North Broadway Baptist Church in Tilsonburg, Ontario. If you have any questions about today's service or any prayer requests, please let us know. Our email is northbroadwaychurch at gmail.com, or you can send us a private message on Facebook or Instagram. To find out more information about us, you can check out our website at northbroadwaychurch.ca. There you can also find out about special events and different ministries for kids, youth, and adults. From everyone here at North Broadway, thank you. And we look forward to having you join us again next week.